On today's show, we talk to a brand new dad who's struggling with a little baby girl who won't sleep. We talk to a young man who's trying to love his mom who's an alcoholic. And we talk to a wife who lives in a home where the gas lights burn brightly. Woo! Stay tuned. Hey, what's up? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show. The show where we talk about your mental health, your relationships, your life, the good stuff, the tough stuff, all of it. Man, we're so glad you joined us. There's literally 750 trillion podcasts from some dude in his basement talking about his favorite kind of toads to, I don't know, real podcast. And then there's this one, and I'm so grateful that you joined us. Rumor has it we are up to 39 listeners, and so... Surely we don't have all of you on right now. So I'm I'm guessing we've got about 12 of you now. Out of the total 39, that's, you know, about 33%. I'm good with that. So, hey, we're glad that you're here. Tell your friends. And if this is like a guilty pleasure and you don't want to tell your friends, super understand that too. But listen, if you want to be on the show, talk about... Ah, I said listen. Kelly, five bucks in the jar. For those of you that's a little inside baseball... One of the most annoying things in the world is when you're listening to something, somebody talking to you, or you're listening to a podcast, and they say, hey, listen, your response should be, I am, idiot, I am listening. So I've decided I'm going to say, give Kelly five bucks. Um, She's drastic, dramatically overpaid for what she does, but who doesn't need another five bucks here and there? Um, When I said listen. So back it up. I would love for you, if you want to be on the show, you want to talk about mental health, your relationships. Um, I don't charge anything, and the advice is worth about what you pay for. But I'd love to have you on the show. If you want to be on, give me a call, 1-844-693-3291. Leave a message. Let us know what's going on. Um, like 1984, 86. Leave a detailed message and your number at the beep. Or if you want to email us, you can go to johndeloney.com slash ask. Fill out the form and we will get back to you. James is still gone, so we got the maestro, Ben Hill, playing with the knobs over there and doing a great job. You're communicating well. Oh, thank you. Um, We're going to have to have a hard conversation, me and James, when he gets back from helping others or whatever community service he does. Kelly, you're brilliant as always. I can't hear you. I was just talking about how good Ben was doing, and I guess he didn't plug you in. (laughs) Well, how about that? Oh, we're back. There we go. See, you bragged on Ben. (sighs) Looks like James still has a job. That was actually (laughs) totally my fault. (laughs) Man, talk about moving up to the big leagues and striking out. Striking out. Yeah. Sorry, Ben. Just kidding. But actually, I have a question. Okay, what's your question? So, I'm- <laughs> <laughs> just so everybody listening, anytime Kelly says, "I have a question," usually it's, "Why is it hard for you to get to work yeah, on or, time?" Why or, are you an idiot? Wow. No. <laughs> so, Kelly, no, this what's is your an question? actual question that I need you to your knowledge. Okay. So, I've heard you talk about ruminating before. Yes. And ugh. I'm a ruminator from way back. Love to replay conversations or how conversations I think I should have. Imaginary ones where oh, you yeah. always win. Oh, uh, where I win them all, <laughs> by the way. My- all of them. And I'm amazing and sharp and witty and I just crush the other person. Yes. But I've I've had one before where that actually played out. Oh, you got to actually have the conversation? Yeah. And it it, it was devastating. <laughs> Not because I won. Yes. But because it just didn't go like I planned, and I th- said all the things that I wanted to say, yes, and there was some collateral damage, and it was one of the worst things. It's this horrible memory in my f- head, but yeah, yeah. I didn't never knew what that was called until I've heard you say ruminating. So can you expound on that? Because you you talk about it sometimes, and you use the word, and I think there's probably a lot of us out there that do it. Uh-huh. So can you talk about that and explain it? Yes. Let me ask you one more question. Are you a catastrophizer? Meaning, do you like to, do you see the worst case scenarios with your kids or your husband or your situation or your no, work? Because no, because I'm very much a realist. Okay. You know, very to the point. Enneagram, I know you don't believe in it, but eight, yeah, that yeah, kind yeah. of just, this is just it. Just do it. For those so, of y'all who don't know what the Enneagram is, if you just um, pick some glitter and throw it in the air and be like, ah, it's kind of like that. Okay. So you're an eight. Right. Which means you've designated yourself as a hard charger. 
Um, I'm a challenger. Challenger. I, ch- okay. I challenge things. Gotcha. And my husband uses the term bulldozer. <laughs> Man, he's delicate with his with his work. Uh, we all it's love a cute it. nickname. We all love a delicate husband. Okay, so ruminating is um it's when those thoughts like lightning bolts pop into your head. And then they the way I look at it is um seeds fall on a, a field, right? And ruminating is when I make the decision and I, I am pretty intentional about that language. When I choose to water those seeds, fertilize those seeds, and just spend a lot of time dwelling in those. My, my, my ruminating is, was often, especially when I was younger, was about fights. I would have these imaginary physical confrontations with people, and they would always play out in a way where I, I was incredibly victorious. And then um, I joined an MMA gym and learned how to fight. And realized, oh, that would have not gone that way at all. It would have ended terribly for me. Um, but also, I'm a bad ruminator. I tend to be a catastrophizer. Um, you know, recently, you know, the Gulf of Mexico, south of where I grew up, was on fire, right? I look at that, and then it's 110 degrees in Portland, and all of a sudden, I'm wondering what my grandkids are going to eat and how they're going to do this. And, oh, and here's a conver- and then I go back to the here's the conversations I'm going to have right now, and they're going to go like this, and then the senator's going to say I don't, I, you can't handle the truth, and I'm going to be like I can't, right? And then none of that goes that way. So ruminating is when those thoughts lightning bolt into your head, and you give them an audience, and then you stir that pot. Sometimes some of us um, stir that pot with a wooden spoon. Sometimes we um, push, put it in a blender, and we hit a button. So Kelly. For me, it's understanding what you just said. Very few people get an opportunity to live one out. And it feels like um, I'm going to win this this conversation. It's going to feel so good. I'm going to do this and this. And then you have it. And there's collateral damage. Somebody's listening. Kids are involved. You hurt somebody and you think that's going to feel good. It doesn't. Ruminating is a waste of time. And here's where I think we get addicted to it is it feels like productive worrying. It feels like we are protecting ourselves and worrying. It feels like I'm going to have my conversation with the boss and I'm going to get this raise and I'm going to let them know that they've been. It always feels like it's going to feel good and it doesn't. Here's a good example. I testified in a court case once. It was a heartbreaking situation. The guy got a a long um, prison sentence. It was heartbreaking for everybody. I liked this guy. He was a funny guy, but he also did some some pretty gnarly stuff. Um, I testified in the case and... I thought that I would feel good when justice was served. And I remember the next morning when the sentence was read, I I got, it was queasy. I felt gross. And I called a mentor of mine who did a lot of testifying and I asked her, hey, I just feel like he got sentenced to jail and there's some justice for the victim. And she said, nobody wins. Nobody wins in these situations, right? So when you have the big justice conversation and I'm going to tell them this or I'm going to fist fight that or I'm going to – nobody wins when you ruminate. Um, sitting in your bed and catastrophizing, thinking of the worst case and the worst case and the worst case and the worst case, it's just magical fantasies, man. It's as much a fantasy as uh, unicorns are going to land and I'm going to get the guy and he's going to complete me or we're going to have a family of four and suddenly we're all going to feel better. It's just not real. It's not true. It's a fantasy. And so catastrophizing, um, ruminating, it's a waste of time. So what I do, um, I've got two strategies that I use because I do it a lot. Um, or I start to do it a lot. I don't do it much anymore. Number one is I literally say the word out loud, out loud, nope, stop. And I will say those words to myself. My wife will just roll her eyes and laugh because I'll be walking through the living room and I'll just say, nope. And she'll look and go, all right, Deloney's talking to himself again. Um, but I'll just say, stop. And when it gets where it's starting to spin on me, I will literally write down these thoughts one at a time. And you've heard me say this, but then I'll just go line by line and demand evidence from them. Usually it feels like there's a hundred things in my head and usually it's about six or it's about nine and I'll write them down. Three of them may be true. One of them I can do a thing about. The other two I can't. And then the rest of it's usually garbage. It's not true at all. I, I, I don't have any data to support my thoughts or feelings or anything on it. So, um, that's what I do with ruminating. Hope that helps. Um, thanks for the call, Kelly. Appreciate that. You're very welcome. Thank you. And I don't think you're a bulldozer. 
I, th- I think you probably do, but that's okay. <laughs> I've learned to accept that. Oh my gosh. I just choose, I, we get things done. You're such a bulldozer. All right, let's go to James in Indianapolis. What's up, brother James? How are we doing, man? Not bad. How are you doing, Dr. Dolly? We are making it work, dude. Making it work. Doing all right. So what's up? How's it going? Yeah, well, um, I'm not sleeping well because in about 15 days ago, not about 15 days, exactly 15 days ago, uh, my wife gave birth to our beautiful daughter. All um, right, man. Congratulations, dude. 15, thank you. 15 days ago. So you're, is this your first one? Yep, it is our first one. Congrats, man. So why aren't you sleeping? Um, well, it you was, like what, well, <laughs> you like what I did there? I know why you're not sleeping. Yeah. You have another human in your house that just poops and screams all day long. All the time. <laughs> Except for. Oh man, that was such a dad exhale. Okay. So, but in all seriousness, <laughs> tell me what's going on, man. Yeah. So it actually has to do with sleeping. Um, so in the middle of the night, you know, I'm, I'm with my kid. Um, and, and my question is, how do I really maintain that connection with my daughter? when I'm frequently frustrated and sometimes angry with her just because she's yelling and screaming for no apparent reason. Yeah. A um, couple of things. We'll back out of that. What is, what's your sure. arrangement right now? Here's sure. what I mean by arrangement. Um, I've heard, I don't know anybody specifically, but I've heard some folks that were, have a arrangement with their wife or husband if I'm up feeding the baby, you're up too, right? And my wife, her philosophy, and and most of the women I know, my wife's philosophy was, I'm going to be up. One of us has to be sleeping. One of us has to be clear-headed mm-hmm. throughout the day. Um, it's ridiculous for you to get up. And then after a couple of weeks, they developed a really unique um, – relationship that she didn't want me getting involved with, right? So she did, I mean, sleep deprived, sleep starved. Um, Once she was able to pump and all that stuff, then I could get up in the middle of the night and feed and change diapers and stuff like that. Um, But, you know, then she had to get up pump anyway. So it was just a whole thing, but what's y'all's arrangement? Yeah, so um, right now we're we're breastfeeding, or my wife's breastfeeding. There you go. I'm very bad at that. (laughs) We're not Um, doing anything. (laughs) She is, but... Okay. Um, so, so usually what happens is um, I'll wake up when the kid's screaming, um, and you know, or, or just unhappy, generally unhappy. I'll take care of her when it's time to eat, and I give her over to mom. Mm-hmm. Uh, I go to sleep for you know the fifteen or forty-five minutes, however long it is, mm-hmm. you know, and hopefully when the kid's done uh, eating, we put her back in the crib and it's all good but sometimes you know then i'm back awake yeah uh looking at the kid and you know my wife um was c-section so i'm trying to give her as much sleep as possible so that she can actually heal and cover yeah and not be you know down and out for the next um teen weeks yeah yeah so um first man i'm glad thanks for being involved dad thanks for being a husband who's mm, thinking big you. picture about his wife um sometimes I take a lot of calls from dads that aren't, so I appreciate you being an involved guy. Um, so there is the C-section. Like you hear about it so much that you forget that it's like somebody gets cut open and they take their guts out and then take a human out and then put guts. I mean, it's a major surgery, right? And we don't yeah. often think that. We just like, oh, I just had a C-section. Sweet, cool. Not sweet and cool. It's a big deal. It's common, but it's a big deal. So yes, there's a there is a necessary I man. Y'all are in it, and here's the thing: take the baby out. You would be waking up in the middle of the night if your wife had a major surgery like this. Anyway, that's who you are, mm-hmm. right? Um, mm-hmm. And then you toss a kid in there. That yeah, you're looking at two in the morning. Your brain's not fully on, and it's not fully off, and you just got this being who has took yeah. taken your wife away from you. She's taken your money away from you. You're exhausted, and she just won't stop screaming. Right. Yeah. So well, go ahead. I was saying, and, 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 you know, the, the really, the feeling I had uh, six days ago was really, there was a, 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 you know, one main event, but it's, it happens a lot, but it's like, I instantly switch from, you know, this is my daughter. This is my, this is another human to yeah. This is a machine yeah. that is broken. Yep. And I, the self, we say, you know, we want to, I grew up in the self, um, you know, want to give her something to cry about but yeah yeah, yeah. It, 
and and obviously I'm not at all going to do any of that. Right, it's right. just instantly in my brain that happens. Yeah. So number one, dude, you're exhausted. Give yourself some grace, okay? Parents, um, and, and we don't. This doesn't get talked about a lot. Um, postpartum and women is talked about a lot, and intrusive thoughts, and angry thoughts, and violent thoughts. There's a lot of literature and discussion on that. It's not with guys, okay? And so I want you to know, being raged out at two in the morning after on week two, and your wife can't move, and this little baby is screaming her head off. Um, you're not crazy, okay? You will not, under any circumstances, ever hit this kid. Got it? Yes. Are we in agreement on that? Oh, yes. 100%. Cool. You'll put the baby down and you'll walk outside and take a walk down the street if you get to that place. Okay? Yeah. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't want you to spook yourself or freak yourself out just because you're, you're at the end of your psychological capacity right now and you're fried. Okay? Um, I think it's an important moment to have a couple of conversations, one with your wife, one mm -hmm. about just about sleep, about catching up, about what this looks like. The second thing is, man, do you have somebody that could come stay with you for a night and just let you get ca caught up a little bit? Like a friend or a parent or a grandparent who would just say, hey, I need a night? Um, we have a couple of friends in the area. We just um, moved about a year ago. Okay. So we're still trying to get the relationships but um, here's what would be a gift, but, and it may be a buddy, it may be one of your mm -hmm. guy friends, it may be um, one of your wife's friends. Um, it may be a, a moment when you call somebody, and hey, he, people want to help. They often don't know mm -hmm. how. They don't, ha you know, they don't know how. But if you ask, hey, I need, I've got to. I'm fried. I got to get some sleep one night. Um, could you come over? And when the baby gets up, here's what we need you to do, and here's how to help. It will help you reach out for help, which you're going to need to do over the course of this kid's life, and it would give somebody else something to do. Um, that may be an option here. Um, here's another big thing, dude. <sighs> Anger just points you towards something you care about, okay? And everything in your life is different now. And at some point, y'all are going to have to sit down and have a fun, dreaming adventure about what was. How long were y'all married before you, get, where you had this kid? Uh, three years. Okay. Almost four years. Almost four years. So... Let's just be a realist about it. How long did y'all date before that? Um, three years. Okay. So half a decade, the better part of, of right, six mm -hmm. years, y'all had butterflies, you made out and hooked up whenever you want to. Y'all just randomly went to movies on Wednesday nights, you went to concerts together, and e everything was cool and messy and... You could be angry at each other and then fix it, whatever, right? And now mm -hmm. everything is new. And the challenge is your anger often comes from, I remember what was, and I just need to get back to that. And so there's a part of what y'all are experiencing right now that that's not coming back. You have a new cool <laughs> thing and you have to be intentional and honest and open about what this new cool thing is going to be. And it's going to happen one way or the other. So architect and engineer it right? Draw it up. Tell you what it's going to look like. Here, it's going to be this new cool thing. Those days are over, but we're still going to be able to make out whenever we want to. We may have to just put on a calendar sometimes, or we're still going to be able to X and Y and Z go to a movie on a weekday, but we're going to have to call somebody this time. All mm -hmm. that stuff will change and shift, and it's not any less than. It's just different. You just have to be intentional, so all of a sudden, you're not living in this past, right? Mm -hmm. And bro, listen, you're two weeks in. <laughs> Everything feels crazy right now. I promise promise Whew, it'll settle back okay did you ever okay. play sports in college in high school or college oh uh, i did cross country oh my gosh perfect okay so where what you what did y'all run about three and a half miles on a normal race um we did 4.8 4.8 8k yeah okay you got bunched up and everybody went out too fast and you're at mile one and a half and you are looking down at your watch and you realize that you are out way too fast and you can't slow down. That's where you're at right yeah. now. Okay. You don't stop the race. You don't just quit. You don't go, Ugh, but you are exhausted and you realize, oh man, we got a long way to go. Okay. That's where you're at. This season that you're in right now, I promise you, promise you, promise you will end. Okay. I promise mm -hmm. it'll be a few months, but it will end. 
So I want you to do two things for me. Number one, I want you to tell me, you're two weeks in, what's something you miss about the old days already? And be honest, there's a bajillion men out there listening. And they'll know if you're lying. I, yeah, I, I, honestly, I just miss the, the, the ability just to sit down and, and cuddle with my wife. It, you know, it's, it's hard when you have a, a kid, you know, you sit down on the couch and it's like, oh, she's awake. Let me go change the diaper. Yeah. I promise, promise, promise that will come back. Okay. Hmm. I promise. What's something that you are really excited about? I'm really excited to be able to really pour into, into Nikki and to my daughter and be able to raise her in a, you know, in a way that she can make a impact in the world. You know, the best way to do that, Mm -hmm. just let her know that she's loved and some of the best ways you can let somebody know, don't ever let that little girl go to bed without you looking her in the eye, let her know that you love her saying the words Mm -hmm. and, and bro. The, sometimes the, the most important ways to show somebody you love them is the teeny tiny little things. It's the diaper when you're so tired you can't even move your fingers. And when your baby's screaming and screaming, and you just keep holding her and you just keep holding her and you just keep holding her. Or you put her down or you hand her to your wife or you do something, right? But you keep showing up and you keep showing up and you keep showing up. If you feel raged out to where you're going to hurt somebody, you're going to hit somebody. You're going to punch a hole through the sheet walk. I want you to put the baby down and walk outside and go call somebody ASAP. Okay. Um, you don't get those moments back. Okay. I don't think that's you. I think you're exhausted. You're cooked. You miss holding your wife. You want her to be okay. You want her to be able to walk around. You want to be able to go to bed at night and sleep. All those things are real when you're holding a baby that's two weeks old. It's all real. Okay. You're not broken. You're not crazy. Hang in there, hang in there, hang in there. Two things that we talked about earlier, just to wrap up, make sure you call somebody and ask, hey, could one of y'all come over once a week and just give us a break? Um, and that may be, you maybe have to pony up some money and fly your mom out or your, your dad out. My dad comes up sometimes and hangs out with our kids when me and my wife are traveling. It's all, he's awesome. Um, in-laws come in, whatever that looks like. Um, and it may be one of your new friends. And the second thing is, I want you, brother, I want you to get with a guy or two who has kids and have somebody that you can text. A lifeline for me was that I ended up having kids later than my buddies. So I had people I could text and say, am I crazy? And they'd say, no, man, that's just normal. You're good. And there was something norming about having friends in my life that were already down the road from me. There was a couple of times they said, yeah, that's not super normal you should probably call somebody that doesn't look right or that's just a rash or what you know i had (laughs) i had a friend holly she came over like when i had my first kid like what is this is this is this the end and she's like no it's a rash dude you just do this and that i didn't know these things right and so they were helpful my buddy steven came over they're awesome um they live two houses down from us but have a couple of guys in your life that you can call and um let you know whether things need to be checked up on further or and this is just part of it brother You're a good man. Hang in there. You're not broken. Hang in there. Kelly, Ben, I like talking to people who love their kids, even though they don't know how to do it and they don't know what they're doing. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. Hey, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back on the Dr. John Deloney Show. Hey, what's up? I want to take a quick break to talk about the most important question I'm asked almost every day. How do I find a counselor? If you can't find a counselor in your area or you can't afford one, I've got a solution for you. I've partnered with BetterHelp for customized online therapy, video chat, text chat, phone counseling. It's a licensed therapist whenever and wherever you need them. Go to betterhelp.com slash Deloney for 10% off your first month. It's cheaper and it's available all the time. This is for you, your family, and for everyone else that's coming your way. Take care of your mental health. Go to betterhelp.com slash Deloney today. Hey, what's up? All right, let's go to Brandon in Columbus, Ohio. What's up, Brandon? 
Hey, Dr. John, how are you doing? I'm good, brother. How are you? I am doing really well today. Excellent, man. So what's up, man? How can I help? Uh, yeah, so I um, will do a lot of moving pieces, so I'll try to keep this laser focused. But um, Cool, and make sure you're talking to your phone. So, okay. Can you hear me good? Yeah. Um, so grew up, my mom was a pretty intense alcoholic, and um, she recently, well, about seven or eight years ago, um, got sober, thankfully, and um, was doing really well. And then uh, just this year has kind of relapsed, and um, some added medication addictions and um, just some pretty crappy stuff, and then has been in and out of the hospital a bunch um, since January. And, uh, there's a couple like serotonin overdoses and, um, certain stuff like that. Um, she's kind of had some suicidal language in there. Okay. Um, and it's she's been a week in a psychiatric hospital. Um, she's struggling, huh? Yeah, just struggling. So I'm just, I'm, I'm like wondering, um, you know, half, half what's my responsibility, half, uh, like, I just don't know what to do. I feel like she has no will. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it's just, it's just tough. So mm. anything, what's your help. relationship like with her? Not good. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was, it wasn't good growing up. Uh, well, it was awesome growing up until I became the age where I was like, Oh, not everyone's mom drinks this much. So, gotcha. Um, and then it got really bad and then she got sober and we kind of reconciled and it got better. But, um, the last few years hasn't been that good at all. Yeah. Dude, I'm sorry, man. That's all right. Thanks, man. How old are you? I am 25. Man. So, you know this, I'm just going to say it out loud. Um, there's not a lot of givens in the world. Um, not a lot of should always bees, but every little boy, you got brothers and sisters. I have one little down syndrome brother. Okay. Yeah. That's even a whole other complication, but every little yeah. boy, mm -hmm. one of the givens of the universe should be that you can count on your mom mm. and that you can count on your dad and they didn't show up, man. I'm sorry. Do you have a dad in the picture at all? I do. They've uh, they've been divorced for since I was in like seventh grade, um, yeah. and he's he's in the picture. He you know cares for my my brother you know here and there, and um, you know he wants the same for my mom as well, even though they're apart. So yeah. So it sounds like your mom's got a lot of baggage and trauma of her own. She's still wrestling with, huh? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, I uh, I feel like I've tried to have that conversation with her and, you know, um, intense psychotherapy and yeah. I don't know. It just doesn't land. So there's not, my experience has been, there's not a lot of conversation to be had with addicts. Um, there yeah. is a lot of connection to be had, but there's not a lot of, oh, okay. Does that make sense? It's not like they're missing a yeah, piece of totally. information. Most of the true addicts, like you're talking about your mom who've been at it a long, long time, they they know more than anybody how awful this is. They know more than anybody how badly they want to quit. Um, they know what this, like, you're losing your family. You're, they know, right? I don't know a lot of, uh, I know a few, but I don't know a lot of addicts that can't see it, right? Um, yeah. And so that makes those conversations, that makes those learning opportunities hard. Um. Here's the best thing, the, the, a couple things I can give you. It sounds like your mom has crossed a new line where now she's using pills and it's almost as though she's practicing an exit strategy, which mm. often for addicts who've been at it a long time, they just get exhausted. And I don't know that they want to kill themselves as much as they want this thing to stop, right? And so suicide often isn't the problem. Suicide becomes the solution to an exhausted, frustrating just getting hounded and hounded by these ghosts of addiction, right? Mm. Um, what ultimately did she say made her contemplate suicide? Ended up in a psych ward. Yeah, uh, 
she was, um, I was at work one day and around lunchtime, she just, I answered the phone and I could immediately tell that she was, you know, drunk Mm -hmm. and on other stuff and just was like, you know, um, I don't think I can do this anymore. You know, uh, your brother loves you. You need to take care of him. Um, all that stuff, you know? So she, that, that's, that's when I, those conversations, they don't scare me like in a, like horror movie kind of way, but that's somebody who's mm-hmm. not just playing around, right? Sure. That's somebody who's thinking it through and they're making arrangements and they're making a plan, right? Um, mm-hmm. So since she's been out, has she been clean since she's been out of the psych ward or she just go right back? She hasn't, she, it's, it's nowhere near the way she used to be, but it's been like, uh, you know, I, I might talk to her once a week and, um, from what I hear, it seems like she's maybe a couple weeks or a couple days of the week. She's, you know, under something. Um, I don't, not sure it's every day, but definitely back at it since she's been out. Yeah. Okay. Do y'all live in the same town? Uh, we live about 30 minutes apart. Okay. And then real quick, tell me what the situation is with your little brother. Are you, do you have custody of him or does your dad have custody of him? What's the situation with him? Yeah. So he, my, my mom actually lives with her sister, my okay. aunt, okay. um, who's just spent her whole life taking care of other people mm-hmm. and cares for my brother and along with my dad. Okay. So. Sounds like a pretty remarkable woman there, huh? Oh yeah. Incredible. Okay. So there's a couple of short-term and long-term things, okay? Are you a reader? Mm -hmm. I do. I enjoy reading. Okay. So there's two books I want you to read. Number one is a book called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, and we'll link to it in the show notes. It's by Gabor Mate. It's a a new book on – it's not new, but um, it's one of the most revolutionary books on addiction I've ever read. It's hard to read, um, but it is remarkable. The second Mm -hmm. book is a book I read this year that was just astounding, and it's called The Unbroken Brain, A Revolutionary Way of Understanding Addiction. Um, And I'll mispronounce the author's name, but it's Maya, M-I-A-I, Slavitz, S-Z-A-L-A-V-I-T-Z. And again, we'll link to that in the show notes as well. Um, It really reframes addiction it actually walks through the history of addiction how why how and why we started calling it a disease um and the medicalization of it and she reframes it as a learning disorder as a way a body learns to cope over time and when we think learning disorder you think oh just stop or just it's not that easy um it's still super complex but here's what's beautiful um we solve diseases by isolating the disease into a uh, into an isolated room and we give it medicine and we give it a plan and by looking at it as a learning um uh, as a learning disorder really um it you reframe learning disorders through active intense connection right mm. so here's the deal beating up an addict isn't helpful right think of addiction as a connection mm-hmm. disorder It's somebody desperately trying to connect and they can't for whatever reason. If they were traumatized as a kid and learned that relationships will will abuse you, get you hurt, get you killed, then relationships aren't safe. And at the same time, a body has to have relationships and pills and alcohol can help sometimes. So Mm -hmm. beating up somebody, yelling at them, trying to give them new information, sending them books, thats I've just never seen that be successful. An addict has to decide, I'm done with this, and then they have to go get with part of a group, whether that's AA, whether that's a church, whatever that looks like, they have to get with a group of people and learn how to have relationship again, learn how to have safe, vulnerable interactions again. That's why so many people find AA successful. They get to practice relationships together, practice vulnerability together that you can't do when other relationships are going to get you hurt. Um, Some people don't like AA. I I just, I think the idea of it is remarkable. So here's the Mm -hmm. things you can do. Okay. Number one is... Firm compassion, I love you, but here's my boundaries, right? So she can't show up at your house if she's been drinking. If she calls you and she's super drunk, say, hey, mom, I love you. Um, I told you I, 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 I can't talk to you when you're super drunk or you're super high. I love talking to you, though. So tomorrow I'd love to get together and talk to you, okay? So give me a call back. Mm-hmm. 
and gently hang up the phone, right? This is you compassionate and boundaries, okay? The, se- mm-hmm. the second thing is, is getting on the same page with everybody. When's the last time you went and had just lunch or breakfast with um, your mom's sister, the one who's taking care of her, your dad, your little brother? Have you ever just gone out and talked to her? I haven't. Okay. No. So you're 25 now, and so I would tell you, stop looking at this as a little boy, as a, as a teenager. Start looking at this as at some point you're going to be responsible for your mom's extended care. At some point, you're going to be responsible for your little brother. Um, and so I'm going to start leveling up. And what leveling up means is I'm going to take go out to lunch. I'm going to pay, and I'm going to take her out to lunch. And first and foremost, say, thank you so much for taking care of my family. You're a saint. You are a model for me as a young man. I want to learn how and why. Tell me my mom's history. Tell me my dad's history. Tell me my, like what makes my little brother tick. And just listen and learn from her. She sounds like a brilliant, wise, compassionate woman. And this is also going to put everybody on the same page. Probably do the same thing with your dad and start asking him questions. Does he have a special needs trust for your brother? Does he have a will? Some of those, these are just 25-year-old man-to-man conversations now. Okay? Yeah. Um, And what you're doing is you're getting everybody on the same page. And everybody, and you can let everybody know, hey, here's my boundaries with mom. If she calls me and she's drunk, she calls me, she's hot, I'm just going to tell her I love her, but I'm not going to talk to her when she's this way. I'm going to hang up. If she shows up my house drunk, she's not going to be welcome inside my house because my wife's here, my kids my kids are here, et cetera, whatever that's going to look like for you. And then here's yeah. the number four. Constant, constant reaching out, whether that's text messages. I love, you know, I, if you listen to the show at all, I love the handwritten letter every week. I'm going to sit down. This is for you. This is for you, but it ends up being for her. Every week you take 30 minutes or an hour and write her a letter. It could be one page, two page on notebook paper with the lines on it. Um, and let her know how your week was. Let her know that you miss her. Hope she's doing great. But these letters over time, it will slowly, and I'm talking like a drip, like trying to fill up a swimming pool with, with a tiny little drip. It's going to slowly reconnect with her. It's going to give her a part of her heart and her mind. This relationship safe. This relationship safe. It could also spiral her into shame and all that. That's her situation, not yours. But I want you to have a. I want you to look up in five years. In what's that? What's five times fifty? I want her holding two hundred fifty letters from her son. They just say pretty much some variation of this week was a hard week. This was a good week. I met a girl. My wife marriage is doing good. Whatever your life situation is, we're having a baby. And I want you to know I love you and I hope you're doing well. Right? If you mm-hmm. can set up once a week or once every two weeks. Hey, we're going to meet for breakfast at Cracker Barrel at nine o'clock. I'm paying. Here's the thing. Sometimes she's going to show up drunk. Sometimes she's not going to show up at all. And it's going to hurt over and over again. But part of this is you healing too. And all you can heal is you and you heal through connection. So I'm going to keep reaching out. I'm going to keep reaching out. I'm going to keep reaching out. Okay. Don't take it personal when she doesn't show up. Don't take it like, oh, my mom hates me. She doesn't. She's just not well. Right. She's really struggling. Um, and then just know this. I've done this, man. Not with my mom, but I've I've had relationships with addicts and it's just heartbreaking. And so you gotta take care of yourself, making sure you're eating well, making sure you're taking care of stuff. There's a part of your body and brain and heart that is gonna need connection too, dude, because your mom wasn't there for you for a long, long time, right? Mm. Can I ask you this? Do you have what are your addictive mechanisms? What are your numbing behaviors? Mm. Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, You've got them. What are they? I, yeah, I definitely. Uh, there's. Um, I've learned this, especially this year, about myself. Is my wife is uh, the first one to point it out, which is awesome and not awesome at the same time. <laughs> I was just she, about to say, awesome, not awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I. I am the ten. I'm. Man, flee from conflict yep. um, is like my middle name. And so okay. what that looks like is just like any hard thing. I'm just, how can I put every single little thing into my schedule yep. so that I don't have a single second to think about a hard thing? There you go. Um, and your schedule can become an addiction because it's your heart and mind and brain's way of trying to control everything because you lived in chaos, right? Mm-hmm. And here's the thing. It will move from 
your schedule to something else, to something else, and it will just expand on you. And so learning how to do relational conflict now, re- relational conflict in the past got you hurt, right? It got you beat up. It got you set on fire. It got you, your mom took off on you or whatever. That's a corners. It's like air. You got to learn how to do conflict for your marriage, for your kids. And so I, man, I can't recommend enough that you go see somebody. Go see him with your wife, right? And she sounds like an awesome, awesome woman, awesome partner for you. Go see somebody um, and tell, let them know. I grew up in the home of an alcoholic. I grew up in a home of with divorce. I grew up with a special needs little brother. Um, I got a lot to unpack and I got some skills I need to learn. I need to learn conflict. I need to learn what love looks like because I didn't see it growing up. I need to learn how to practice, how to have hard conversations because I got a lot of those ahead of me. Um, and then you and your wife are going to have to just understand probably we're going to be taking care of my little brother and have him around a lot, have him a part of the life of your life, whatever that looks like for y'all. But yeah, you're at that 25 age and that's when things get hard. So I've given you a lot here. I'm not going to recap it all, brother. I want you to, to know this. I'm grateful for your heart, man. It's a heartbreaking call when a, when a son calls me and says, man, how do I love my mom? And when my mom doesn't even love herself. It's hard and it's you just got to keep showing up and got to keep showing up. Listen to this episode. Do it with your, Listen to it with your wife. Y'all come up with a game plan on what this is going to look like for y'all, what boundaries and compassionate boundaries are going to look like, what firm boundaries are going to look like. Take the folks out to dinner that you need to take them out. Get, get your will, get special needs stuff taken care of. Whew. And you're in it for a long haul, brother. But I wanted you to know there's healing and laughter and joy on the other end of this deal. And I'm proud of you for being willing to do the work. You're awesome, man. All right, let's take one more quick call. Let's go to Hannah in Fort Wayne. Hannah, what's going on? Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm pretty good. Um, <laughs> good. <laughs> When it, so uh, man, anyone says like, oh, pretty good. You're not. So what's, <laughs> what's up? Um, yeah, so I'm 33 years old. Um, I never necessarily thought I had an anger issue. Um, it, it never um, was visible in my childhood or anything like that. Um, I think of myself as a pretty easygoing person. But uh, Who in your life is telling has- you that you have an anger issue? <laughs> well, I mean, me when I, I mean, it's very evident that I do, but uh, it has to do with my marriage. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's, it has to do with when I make a mistake, which in marriage you do, um, you know, maybe oh, wait, I'll whoa, whoa, things. whoa. I do not ever, ever <laughs> make a mistake. Oh, that's I'm, nice. I'm totally kidding. I make them, <laughs> I made like seven this morning. Okay. So when yeah. I, whenever you make a mistake, then what? Um, so then, you know, I'll apologize for it and say, yeah, you know, I did that. Um, he'll, he'll ask me, you know, why did you do that? And I'll kind of explain or something. And then he'll say, well, you're making excuses. Um, and then I said, I'm not, not making excuses. I'm trying to, to not, you know, do it again. I'm trying to just, you know, talk through it. And, um, and then, you know, he'll say, you just need to just literally when I make a mistake, say, just, I don't know, I guess he doesn't want me to ever talk about anything of why and just own up to it. Um, but you know, I did apologize. Um, but then what are these mistakes, Hannah? (laughs) Like, is it like he keeps coming home and his best friend is in your bedroom? Is it this mistake or is it like, I didn't (laughs) take the trash out? No. Um, I mean, it started early on. um, Like if I say things uh, in front of his friends or family, um, that, you know, upsets him or embarrasses him, even if it's like, you know, Jordan doesn't like to eat vegetables. Um, you know, that he doesn't like if I say that necessarily. Um, so, and I, to, I'm a very blunt, honest, that's a struggle for me. I mean, I, I'm just making conversation. I might, I mean, and I do say something I shouldn't say, and I understand that at the same time, I can't guarantee I'll never do that again. Um, so what, one of the so, cornerstones of somebody who is in a relationship with somebody who is emotionally immature is... They, for instance, are sitting somewhere and somebody brings up vegetables and you say, oh, he's not going to eat that. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly he gets his feelings like that is becomes a death blow to his soul. Right. Mm-hmm. And then at home, it becomes a whole thing. How dare you put me on blast in front of my friends and family? And you're like, dude, I'm sorry. I forgot about the don't thing about vegetables thing. Like, I don't want to hear it. You just don't even, you don't, I don't want to just make excuses. Right. 
What mm-hmm. happens in short order is you start feeling crazy. Mm-hmm. And this is, and it, this is, this is <laughs> like the gas lights burn brightly in Hannah's home in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you start feeling crazy. And then all of a sudden you start trying to filter everything that you say and every joke you tell and every like, okay, is this okay? Is this okay? And that bar moves. Because when somebody who's, when a great gaslighter gets a hold of somebody, they start, that, that finish line, there's never a moment when. It would, then it will be, you didn't look at me enough. Or you kept looking at that guy. Or why are you talking to my mom more than me? And then you're like, okay, I'll solve for that problem. And then pretty soon you're just sitting at home, not doing anything, right? Mm-hmm. And you feel insane. And then you get raged out, right? And so mm-hmm. insanity, I often like to describe as like being in a, in a, like my shoulders are clenched right now. Your whole situation is making me crazy. (laughs) I don't get crazy on the show. This is one that makes me, my skin crawl. Um, It's like Mm -hmm. being in a pet kennel. And then eventually you just rage. Like you just start rattling the, 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 the cage. And then the person who's gaslighting you goes, see, see. And then you go, oh, I just did that. I've never done that. What's happening? I must be crazy. And it just all reinforces itself in this weird nutty dance. Does that make sense? Yeah, that sounds exactly right. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, I can't stand this. Okay, how long have you been married to this guy? About nine and a half years. Okay, has this been going on forever, or is it slowly just moving and moving and moving and moving? No, it started early on. Okay. Yeah, right away. Okay. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Two things. this, uh, This ends one of three ways. Not two ways, one of three ways. Number one... It ends with tragically some separation of some sort, and you are completely nutty. You are cooked. And he is self-righteous, indignant, and justified, and it ends with somebody having an affair or somebody just imploding, okay? Mm -hmm. Something just blows up, right? Because here's what happens, Mm -hmm. and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. You stop. You start keeping secrets, You stop telling him about things that happened at work. You stop telling him about a way you feel about something. And then eventually you will find someone else to talk to. Yes, that has happened. Yes. And he will, whether he cognitively knows it or not, he will feel that you stop talking to him. And he has to connect. He's a person. And he's going to find somebody to connect to. And all of a sudden, it's everybody's in la-la land, and they didn't mean to get there. But that's here's where we are, right? Mm -hmm. So that's step number one. Step number two, everybody just slowly drowns. And you Mm -hmm. wake up, and you've been married for 20 years, and your roommates, you don't like him. He doesn't like you. Your kids are just whatever. And you go to baseball games and sit by each other, usually with a kid in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just a slow suffocation. Or the third is somebody turns all the lights on, stops the music, and stops this dance that's been going on for nine years now, and says, I love you too much to let you continue to say I'm not a good person because I talk about vegetables. You've Mm -hmm. got to grow up and deal with your emotional immaturity. I do love you, and yes, I want to honor and respect your boundaries, and if you don't want me talking about our marriage or whatever out in public, fine. Also, you knew who you married, and I'm loud, and I'm fun, and I like to be silly, And I like to make jokes, and that's the way I show love. And yes, I go too far. And now I'm talking to myself here, by the way, Hannah. Um, (laughs) And I know there's certain, like, there's just certain things on this show I've talked about. And my wife has said, "Hey, I heard from a friend um, that this came up. She didn't listen to the show, and um, she said, "Hey, that's ours. Don't talk about that." And she was right. And I wasn't trying to be mean or or rude, or but that was fair. Um, But that line is not just continuing to move, right? But somebody's got to throw a flag and say, I'm going to see a marriage counselor. I'd love for you to come with us because I think our marriage is in trouble. And I'm telling you right now, it is in trouble. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, You should be able to be you and at the same time, be respectful and treat your husband with dignity. And at the same time, he should be able to be him and treat you with dignity and respect. And this just sounds like a, (laughs) it just sounds like the toilet bowl is starting to spin faster and faster and faster. And somebody's got to hit the, hit the pause button. Am I right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and we have uh, done marriage counseling two different times, okay. um, both of of me saying we need this because I'm like, I'm a crazy person, you know, I'm so <laughs> like, I, I need help, you know, and 
one time um, he didn't want to do it. And I was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm just going to go by myself. I'm mm-hmm. just going to do it, you know? And, and then after a few sessions, this is my pastor's um, wife, you know, said we need to get him here. And um, so, yeah, we have done that. That's my other concern is I don't know. I feel like I'm always, you know, and, and to be honest, I did tell him about this call today because I. I oh, I just lost your hand. Are you still there? I want to make sure. Oh, there you go. Okay. You know, if he's not comfortable, I don't want to do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got there's you back. Storm. I'm in my car. There's a storm. Okay. Um, but uh, but yeah, we've we've been down this road before. Okay. Um, and you know, I'm always the one that says we need help. Yep. Um, so that that's also a concern. It is, I, but I, it, I he, he has no incentive to get help because you. Know, that, but he has no incentive to get help because you change every time. Mm-hmm. And you're the crazy one, right? Mm-hmm. So there's no incentive. Yeah. Okay. There's there's nothing in his world that is rattling his world because every time you rattle it, you fix it. You stop doing your thing. Gotcha. And so, number one, mm-hmm. I'll like, are you crazy? No, I don't oh. think so. Okay, now. A lot of crazy people don't know they're crazy, Hannah. Are, are, is it you? Uh, I, I, I don't think so, but I do get really <laughs> frustrated when I'm, when I do apologize and then, and it's like, I'm expected to be perfect. And I'm like, that's impossible. It is. You're right. So You're it right. It gets me. I yes. mean, it is. So I, I've never, and I've never been treated this way before. I've never, I mean, this is all. So I don't think I am, but I've right. also never been in this position before. Exactly. That's right. So, um, oh, man, do you have a relationship with his parents? Yeah. Yeah. We have good relationship with both, both sides. Okay. Um, I want you to read a book called, um, gosh, I've just lost it. It's about emotionally mature parents. Um, adult adult kids adult children of emotionally immature parents i want you to read that book okay okay and it's a book for adult children who are trying to figure out why they are why they are but and it talks about their parents but i've also okay. seen couples go oh i live in this now okay i want you to read that mm-hmm. book and if it hits home maybe he'll read it too ultimately i think you're going to need to find a therapist that is a relational life therapist, and that's out of the school of Terrence Real, uh, Terry Real. You've got to find a therapist that will take your husband on. Mm-hmm. And most marriage and family therapists won't do that, and okay. it's a shame. But some, and, and that will take you on too, because I know you're not perfect in this deal. Um, mm-hmm. But I also know nine years of scar tissue becomes nine years of scar tissue, right? Mm-hmm. So I guarantee, if he was on the phone. Um, he would be telling me another story, and his story probably makes sense too. Okay, mm-hmm. and if he wants yeah. to call me, I'd love to talk to him also. Um, I don't want to paint him as the evil guy here, but I yeah, what you're telling me is just a playbook, and I've seen it over and over and over again. Okay, and I'm just telling you, it doesn't end well. And so I want somebody, whether that's you, flip on all the lights and say, I'm going to go take care of me because that's at the end of the day, you've already tried marriage therapy. You've got to find somebody that will take him on. Um, call somebody and let them know and sit down and say, I want to get well. I want to take care of me. That doesn't mean you're trying to figure out ways that you can be perfect. That means that you are trying to figure out ways to deal with a heavy gaslighter, somebody who's emotionally mature, somebody who's struggling on their own that doesn't have the skill set to be in a marriage right now, that doesn't know how to communicate well, right? And here's the other thing, Hannah. I've ganged up on him a little bit or a lot. If there are things like, hey, I don't want you talking about our sex life with our friends, then don't do that, right? There's a balance here too. Um, hey, I don't work out enough and I'm embarrassed about my body. Don't call me, you know, fatso. Whatever the thing is that there is a line there, right? Um, that make sure that you're honoring and treating him with dignity too. Um, but don't be in a relationship. I'm not, I'm not telling you get divorced. I'm telling you, don't be in a relationship where somebody is constantly making you feel insane, making you feel crazy, making you feel like you're evil. And you're sitting there going, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. 
you got to go see somebody. So get that book. We'll link to it in the show notes here. And then you start seeing somebody today. Call somebody today that you haven't talked to before and get straight to the point. I live with a with a um, fire-breathing gaslighter, and I don't know what to do anymore, and I got to learn some skills on how to handle this. Invite him if he'll come, and uh, but he's got to have to have a therapist that will take him on. All right. Thank you so, so much for the call, Hannah. Ah, we'll be thinking about you. I know those are hard, 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 hard. And to Hannah's husband listening to this, dude, I bet you're a good guy. In fact, I almost count on it. I bet you're a good guy. And I bet that everything feels personal and it feels like you're being attacked by a woman who loves you. And I want you to hear me say, I don't think she doesn't love you. I think she does love you a lot. I want you to have the courage and the strength to say, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm playing a part in this. Maybe I've got a key role that I'm playing here. Maybe I've got to learn some new skills. Maybe every time my feelings get hurt, um, it isn't always somebody trying to go after me or hurt me. Maybe I need to learn some emotional intelligence or some relational intelligence. I need to learn some skills. Have the courage to do that, man, and go open-handed. Don't make a therapist take you on. Go say, hey, I am want to be vulnerable here. I get take things so personally, and I know this woman loves me. Oh, I got some things I got to learn. Go be brave, man. Go be brave. And uh, call me back and let me know how that goes. All right? I'd love to talk to you. All right, as we wrap up today's show, the song of the day, the greatest song ever written was chosen by Kelly. It's a song that makes her heart feel full. It's off the Moonface record by the one and only Van Morrison. The song's called Into the Mystic, and it goes like this. <laughs> We were born before the wind, also younger than the sun. Ere the bonny boat was won, as we sailed into the mystic. Do you know what a bonny boat is? I don't. Hark now, the, hear the sailors cry. Smell the sea and feel the sky. Let your soul and spirit fly. Where? Into the mystic. And when that foghorn blows, I'll be coming home. Mm -hmm -hmm. And when that foghorn blows, I want to hear it. I don't have to fear it. And I want to rock your gypsy soul. Kelly, I want to rock your gypsy soul just like way back in the days of old. And magnificently, we will float into the mystic mm -mm -mm, right here on the Dr. John Deloney Show. Mm -hmm.